to uh, talk a little bit about our presenter today, Ms. Barbara Greenleaf. We are delighted to have her um, host this webinar today. Barbara Greenleaf has long been interested in the family, both as a historian and a journalist. She authored Children Through the Ages, A History of Childhood, and Help, a handbook for working mothers. She was also a contributing editor at Working Mother Magazine. Upon graduation from Vassar College, Barbara got her start at the New York Times and went on to write eight books and numerous corporate pieces magazine articles and speeches, one of which won a Best Speech in LA Award. Along the way, she became a mother of two and grandmother of four, so she understands the adult family on a visceral level. For five years, Barbara was entwined with Antioch Santa Barbara, first as a consultant and then as an associate vice chancellor and occasional lecturer in Susan Lang's classes on the family. Welcome, Barbara. Oh, thanks so much, Stephanie. I'm so happy to be here too, and for Ken for facilitating this. Well, we're here, <laughs> we're here to discuss the adult family. It's complicated. For the next 45 minutes or so, I'll be highlighting the dramatic changes that we have in our domestic arrangements and looking at the generational differences in lifestyle and attitude that are causing so much angst in the American family today. Along the way, you'll get to solve some Dear Abby-like scenarios dealing with the thorny issues that inevitably crop up between parents and their grown offspring. By the end, I hope you'll understand what's really happening in American society, and we'll have gained those insights that help you navigate your own adult family. I mean, which we know is perfect, but I always say there's no relationship so perfect that it can't be improved upon. Today's talk is based on my new book. This is like the shopping channel. Um, <laughs> Parents of adult children, you are not alone. And my commercial is available in Tecolote, Chaucer's, and on Amazon. Well, I'm often asked why I wrote this book. And so I'm gonna answer that question for you now. While parents of young children have tons of information available to them, there's very little out there actually for parents of adult children. Now this is really surprising when you consider that we'll have, over eight, we'll have our over 18 offspring three times longer than we had our kids when they were little. And more of our interactions with them are much more subtle and complex. Those books that are about the adult family have generally been written from the adult children's perspective where parents often can do little right. So not only do we not get in written information from the older generation's perspective, we hesitate to even bring up problems with our kids when speaking with friends. There's still pressure in our society to pretend, even to ourselves, that everything is perfect with the kids. After all, aren't our grown offspring life's report card and everyone wants to get an A in parenting? To address this situation in January of 2017, I started the blog, which became this book. My goal was to enlighten and liberate mothers and fathers from the code of silence. I wanted to one, let parents know that they are not the only ones and they're not hanging out there all by themselves. I've got your back. Or as I like to say, every day is Mother's Day and Father's Day here. I wanted to provide constructive advice from experts and personal testimony from peers. And thirdly, I wanted to stimulate thinking and discussion about parent-child relationships. Let's start a national dialogue, you and I, about how to interpret the commandment, honor thy father and mother in today's world. Okay, let's get started with the big picture because the adult family does not exist in a vacuum you'll see that there are major changes, so major I think we can call them seismic shifts happening in our society, and I think they only show signs of intensifying. We only have to look around us or among our own relatives to see that families today come in all sizes and shapes. They've been reconfigured by divorce, remarriage, cohabitation, adoption, often across racial and ethnic lines and the weakening of taboos about marrying out. 
Still, for those of us in the older generation, it's hard to let go of that Norman Rockwell, leave it to beaver image of the ideal American family, consisting of father in his suit, mother in her apron, and two perfect offspring who look just like them. Well, as we used to say in New York, forget about it. That ain't what's happening today. Slide. Okay, so here's what's really happening in US households today, demographically speaking. Let's just say that many in the older generation, including people who consider themselves liberal or open-minded, I mean, true Antiochians, right? Find these trends disturbing and some worry about how their children and grandchildren will fare going forward. Let's take a look, slide two. Okay, it's not your imagination. Now only 68% of all families with children under the, 18, under the age of 18 are headed by married couples. That is down from 93% in 1950. That's quite a shift in 70 years. Now, not that all those people in the 93% adored each other, but they stayed together for appearances, for the children, for economic reasons, many of which are gone today. More children live with a single parent. Almost a quarter of all American kids under the age of 18 live in a household headed by a single parent, overwhelmingly the mother. This contrasts with a rate of only 7% worldwide. Sadly, another example of American exceptionalism. Marriage is on the wane. Following a decades long trend, half of US adults were married in 2015, just half were married in 2015, down from 70% in 1950. Now the second slide uh, is incorrect. So I'm going to read you from the book, uh, what I have to get it really accurate. With so many young people getting married later or not marrying at all, cohabitation, cohabitators loom ever larger as procreators. In 1997, the first year for which data on cohabitation are available, 20% of unmarried parents who lived with their children were also living with a partner. Since then, their share has risen to 35%. Now, of course, some of them will go on to marry the father, but not all. Slide four. An astonishing figure. 40% of all American babies today are born to single or cohabitating mothers. 50 years ago, only 10% of births were out of wedlock. That's a really big change. Experts attribute this development to multiple factors. The end of the shotgun marriage, where if a boy or a young man got a girl pregnant, he married her. That's finished. The waning of the stigmatization, stigmatization of single parenthood, the availability of birth control, blurring the lines between good girls and bad girls. And I think we have to add really the flaunting of out of wedlock uh, or illegitimate, whatever you want to call it, births, to celebrities. I mean, the baby bump is no longer confined to married women in the spotlight, to say the least. Slide five. All right, this big shift is mostly due to white women. Their rate of not, excuse me, to, yeah, due to white women. Their rate of non-marriage births has tripled since 1980. Uh, teen pregnancies are down dramatically everywhere. And we can thank sex education, which really works, and the Affordable Care Act for providing uh, protection. Mothers by choice. We don't really know how many women choose uh, to become pregnant by a sperm donor, but some um, of, of these fertility clinics do state that about a third of their clients are single women. So that's a great big change too. Slide six. Okay, we have three generations living under one roof. A record number of Americans, over 60 million, are living in households that include parents, grandparents, and grandchildren. So in part, I mean, of course, due to the uh, horrible house, price of housing, but 
the multi-generational living can also be attributed to the Asian and Hispanic populations, which are growing rapidly and are more likely to have this sort of domestic arrangement. In fact, 20%, I was really surprised to read this, of Americans speak a language other than English in their home. So the immigrant um, influence or the ethnic influence is very dramatic demographically. Okay, so that gives you an idea of the sea in which, in which adult families are swimming today. So while you're digesting this big picture trend, I'm going to bring us down to earth, which is, let's face it, where most of us live, with one of these dear Abby-like situations I mentioned, who pays for what on a family vacation? When I was writing my blog, I found that all matters financial, giving gifts, handing out subsidies, leaving an inheritance, really resonated with my readers because they can cause so much angst and so much friction in the adult family. So here to do the honors with scenario one is that smooth talking Brit, Bill Mays. Bill is gonna set up the situation and give options which are gonna have yes and no answers to them. You can vote for however you wish in the chat box and even say more about how you would handle the situation. There are no right or wrong answers. It's totally anonymous. Later, uh, Phil will read to you what the panels I convened for these different scenarios had to say. Okay, Phil, what are you gonna tell us about who pays for what on a family vacation? Well, that's a very interesting question. The Christmas holidays are fast approaching and Lila and George would like to rent a cabin at a ski resort for the whole family, which includes three 30-something children and two spouses. Everyone would have to fly up, and their single son Paul is struggling financially. Their daughters and sons-in-law are doing much better. Lila and George are retirees who are barely making it themselves. So we've got three questions. Should Lila and George underwrite Paul's airfare, but expect the other two families to pay their way? Are the parents entirely responsible for the cost of the cabin? And lastly, who picks up the bill for food? So um, folks, we've launched a poll. Is everyone um, able to access or enjoying the pop-up where you can uh, answer those questions? Will I see the answers coming through? Very good. There are about 20 seconds left to the, the time poll and then we will uh, we'll proceed to the big reveal. And um, now are the results uh, viewable to, to the room? Yes. Very good. Okay, so I see that the big winners are Lila and George should pay for Paul's airfare. 50-50 are the parents enti entirely responsible for the, re the cost of the cabin. And then the big winner are number three, who picks up the bill for food? Everyone. Okay, Phil, let us know what the panel had to say. Okay, we had four people on the panel. Foster said, when parents can't afford it, they shouldn't try to bribe their adult children to be with them at the holidays by offering a ski vacation. However, if the kids are enthusiastic about the prospect, then everyone should pay his or her own way, and the more well-to-do sibs should subsidize their brother. Stephen said, it's not a bribe. Memories are important, and vacations put everyone in different fun places. The family should problem solve to try to make it happen. However, everyone needs to have some skin in the game. Even if Paul can't pay full freight, he should pay something, such as being responsible for one day of food. Nan said, the point is for the family to be together at Christmas not to show off where they've been on Facebook. Taking the whole crew away for the holidays has been glamorized, 
but it doesn't seem so glamorous when the credit card charges show up. But if the family does go, they should divvy up the costs of the cabin and the food. And lastly, Wilhelmina said, even though it's embarrassing to discuss finances, it's better to get the financial arrangements settled ahead of time rather than harbor resentments. No one wants to feel he's paying more than he's comfortable with or more than his fair share. That would create tensions among the siblings and ruin the vacation before it even starts. Well, that's great, Phil. Thank you so much. And we'll look forward to the other two scenarios. There was a lot of heat around this issue, let me just say. A lot of comments left on my blog. And as one reader said, you're describing my life. So money, the root, I don't know if all evil, but a, a cause of a lot of tension. So looking again at the macro picture, let's zero in on that infamous cohort, the millennials, AKA your children and your grandchildren. Now the term millennial is fuzzy. It's most often re, uh, used to refer to young people born between 1981 and 1996, but it's really just a marketing term. The only cohort recognized by the Census Bureau is baby boomers. 1946 to 64. And we, by the way, are the oldest cohort, although the millennials are threatening to overtake us. Okay, so here I'm going to lump together all the Gen X, Ys, and Zs, because they could make you crazy trying to figure out who is who. And we're just going to call them millennials or the younger generation, just as I'll use boomers interchangeably with the older generation. Okay, boomer? I know that the saying goes, there's nothing new under the sun, but actually millennials may be the exception. For sure, there are a lot of issues surrounding them. They're out of the house and you're experiencing empty nest syndrome. They were out of the house, but now they're back. You're helping them out financially and there's no end in sight. Their values are different. Their vocabulary is different. Their mode of communication or lack thereof is different. Older people call or send emails, they text. We crave human communication. To them, texting is human communication. They may never marry, giving their folks grand dogs instead of grandbabies. And they have tattoos, sometimes lots of tattoos. In some ways, it's the same old generation gap, but in other ways, it's different. Young people seem to be in no rush to get their driver's licenses, learn to cook, or even open a check of banking account, all of which they call adulting, and I'm not so sure they mean it ironically. They often act as if they are exceptional, but studies show that employers can find them entitled and poorly prepared for the workplace. Now, today's parents may be unwittingly abetting this long adolescence by extreme involvement in their grown children's lives. Reports of helicopter or snowplow parents make sh making sure that their college students don't oversleep on exam day by picking out and furnishing apartments for recent grads and even going on job interviews with them are becoming prevalent. Well, at the least, it's a brave new world, not to mention confusing for of our grandchildren and children for those in the older generation to decipher. Slide eight. Next one. More are living at home. Can I have the next slide? Yes, I'm sorry, there was a Wi-Fi streaming pause in okay. our technology. Okay, so we're up to more are living at home. We're there. Okay, in 1960, only 20% of young adults aged 18 through 34 lived in their parents' home. Today, almost a third do. Now this is the first time since records started being kept 130 years ago that anything like this had happened. It's a huge change. 60 years ago, two thirds of young adults lived with a romantic partner, wife, husband, or significant other. Today, only a third do. Now that's another huge historical shift. And <laughs> it's also quite interesting for the parents. So here on the chart, you can see 
graphically what's going on. And this is a trend that seems to be accelerating and not just because of COVID. Okay, slide 10. Adolescence is expanding. Experts agree that the teenage years are now stretching out to encompass 20, 30, and even 40 year olds. Um, now these are people, young people, not so young, who are dependent on their folks for money, shelter, and advice in ways never seen before. So this is quite a shift. Now I don't have to tell you, oh, unenthusiastic about marriage, slide 11. Yeah, in one study of college students, a quarter said they would probably skip marriage altogether. And as we've already seen, the rate of marriage has been falling steadily. So this has huge implications for our society in not forming new households. Not only are people not buying them to furnish these homes, but living together, it's a whole new ballgame. So I don't have to tell you that two generations living under one roof can create tensions and the pandemic has only exacerbated that. But even in normal times, there are often simmering tensions and even shouting matches over a young adult's choice of career, friends, clothes, hairdo, and most especially a future spouse. Okay, we address the last mentioned in our second scenario when speaking up is risky as brought to you by the inimitable Phil Mays. Okay, so um, Charlene feels her daughter, Cara, is making the biggest mistake of her life by marrying her fiance, Tim. In Charlene's opinion, Tim isn't Cara's equal in intellect, education, or earning power. Moreover, she doesn't like the way Tim orders her daughter around. Is he a potential wife beater? Charlene's husband, on the other hand, thinks Tim is a good guy. He doesn't want his, vice, his wife to voice her reservations, lest their daughter feel her parents don't have confidence in her ability to make good choices. So what's a mother to do? We got three choices here. Keep mum and let Kara make her own mistakes. Voice her reservations. Or try and to get Kara and Tim into prenuptial counselling and then compare notes with the counselor. Okay, here comes the poll. All right, we'll have about 20 seconds for you to change your mind or, or weigh in. And it looks set. Okay, well, another split decision about whether the mo mother should keep quiet or let it rip. 31% um, said she should voice her reservations. I was in that camp, let me just share. Um, and trying to get the kids into prenuptial counseling and then compare notes. Boy, that was only 19%. That's interesting. Okay. And now let's hear what the panel had to say. Bill? Yeah, so John on the panel said, uh, Milo's first wife has no place at his milestone birthday. No, 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 no. You have to go back. I'm sorry, where? You want Charlene. I, I want Charlene. Um, I don't have Charlene. Um, no, Liam, Liam. Oh, uh, uh, pardon me, my mistake. Liam, right. Liam said Charlene probably should have said something before Kara became engaged to Tim, but I suppose better late, late is, I suppose late is better than never. She should find a diplomatic way to ask her daughter if she thinks Tim is a long-term proposition. Juan said, I think Charlene should practice watchful waiting. If a really big fl red flag surfaces, such as bruises on her daughter's body, she is obligated to speak up for safety's sake. Molly said, 
Charlene has to zip it. Maybe Kara likes to be ordered around, and maybe she sees qualities in Tim to which her mother is blind. The dynamics of other people's relationships, even one's daughters, are unknowable. And finally, Kendra said, eh, I can see both sides of this situation. Besides, aren't poor choices what starter marriages are for? <laughs> Thanks so much, Phil. All right, we're going now to go from marriage to divorce, which isn't such a big step given the divorce rate in this country. So this is another big issue in the adult American family, your divorce, the kid's divorce, etc. Now, interestingly, the ratio of one in two marriages ending in divorce has remained steady for decades. But what has changed is the divorce rate among those 50 and older, which has been soaring. In fact, gray divorces doubled between 1990 and 2019. These so-called silver splitters can throw a real monkey wrench into family life, as you will see in our third scenario. Everything's more complicated in blended families. And again, the silver-tongued Phil Mays. Phil? Thank you, Barbara. Milo's 55th birthday is coming up, and he wants to have a family gathering to celebrate. His grown children have made it clear they won't attend unless their mother is included too. His new wife will not hear of it because of the bitter fallout from the split. This interfamily conflict is leaving the birthday boy between a rock and a hard place. How do you think he should handle it? Okay, slide 13. Should he give in to I'm, I'm so sorry, Barbara. My, my, my yep. bad. Okay. We have four choices here. Should he give in to his kids? Should he give in to his new wife? Should he forget the party and take his wife on a cruise? Or insist that everyone call a truce and accede to his wishes since it's his birthday? It looks like the poll is set. Another 10 seconds to change your mind. And these are the results. Okay. Well, no one felt he should give in to his kids. Good going, everybody. Give in to his wife, only a few forget the party and take a cruise, which I thought was pretty tempting. Insist that everyone call a truce. Yeah, let him, let him put his foot down, it's his birthday. Okay, thank you so much. All right, Phil, why don't you give us the panel's take on this scenario? Right, the panel, we had four people on the panel again. John said, Milo's first wife has no place at his milestone birthday. If they'd come apart amicably, it will be one thing, but when there's a lot of residual anger, there's no way to pretend this is one big happy family for a night. His second wife is right. And besides, he has to continue living with her. Janice said, under no circumstances should Milo give in to his kids who are using the occasion to bully him. If he gives in to them now, they'll feel empowered to hold a whip over his head forever. Debbie said, Milo has to get a grip, on his family, that is. Everyone is trying to manipulate him, and they're losing sight of who's important here. And Riley said, the cruise is looking better and better. <laughs> Thanks so much, Bill. All right. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about one of the chapters of Parents of Adult Children, which deals with fathers and sons, mothers and daughters. And in it, I discuss playing favorites, which all of us can remember. 
And now it's taboo in our society to say that we like one child more than another. But studies show we do feel closer to one. Adult children recognize this, but they typically feel they're the favored ones. However, as a Cornell researcher found out, they're typically wrong. So in the book, you'll find out why they're wrong. Now, of course, there are a lot of other reasons for discord in the family in addition to playing favorites. There's killer sibling rivalry that never goes away. Divorce, as we were just mentioning, yours and theirs. Money matters, choosing up sides, and on and on. Leo Tolstoy famously wrote in Anna Karenina, happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Now, often the sore point is communications or uh, giving advice, which can trip up even the most well-intentioned parents. The phrase walking on eggshells must have been invented for parent adult child talk. And new technology comes with its own set of decisions about communications. For example, is following your adult child on social media tantamount to stalking? AUSB's Professor Elizabeth Wolfson said, it's not stalking if the child gives you permission. So there. But on the opposite side of the spectrum from those who are constant, who you can't reach, um, are the young adults who phone their folks tw 12 times a day over the slightest decision. And Dr. Wolfson has a great line for that. She says, the umbilical cord runs right through the cell phone. So what should a parent do about giving advice? According to Elizabeth Wolfson, zip your lip and bite your tongue until it bleeds. But kidding aside, tensions can linger and get worse, sometimes leading to total estrangement, which from the messages left on my website and my research into the matter, I find that estrangement is as approaching tsunami, tsunami proportions in this country. And while some families have drawn closer during the uh, coronavirus epidemic, others have experienced even greater strain due to those shelter at home orders. Now, one of the main reasons for the tension and estrangement in a family, an adult family, is the son's wife. Let me share with you that the difficult daughter-in-law garnered six times as many organic searches on the net as all my other posts put together. I was shocked. And the saddest comments that people left were from grandparents who were barred from seeing their grandchildren. I was astounded at the number of organizations such as Invisible Grandparent and Alienated Grandparents Anonymous that have been formed for support and advocacy. The daughter-in-law's parents can also create another whole fraught situation. And I've noticed that the young women take care of their family and the young men take care of theirs. One big happy family exists, of course, but it's more likely to be in an ethnic or first generation extended family in which people put harmony and loyalty above personal differences and to whom family, and here I'm not speaking of the mafia, is everything. These extended families socialize together, raise their kids together, vacation together, and sometimes work together. For the rest of society, the old immigrant cousin circles and monthly get-togethers are pretty anemic and far from monthly. When the oldest generation dies off, they usually disappear completely. And there are a lot of reasons for this, such as mobility and uh, people moving far away. So, it's not totally uh, self-generated, but that nevertheless, there it is. Um, Ken, you might want to come back to me. So now the crux of the matter is, I have found that while most of the older generation take the commandment, honor thy father and mother, quite literally, the younger generation puts a different and much more casual spin on it. Right, we, we shouldn't be there. You wanna come back to me? Uh, that's fine. Um, we showed up- I'm sorry, I don't understand what come back to me means. Do you mean you're simply on screen and no slides, thank you. Thank you so much. We showed up for Sunday dinner 
We gave presents on milestone occasions and we sent cards on Mother's Day. Now the younger generation often thinks that's corny and they don't feel it's up to them to create family togetherness. It's this disconnect between the parents' expectations and the younger generation's sense of obligation that seems to cause the most friction. And it leaves many parents feeling underappreciated and many in the younger generation feeling put upon. Parents used to be venerated and not so long ago. Not for nothing, the sentimental songs of yore, such as M-O-T-H-E-R, and I'll spare you my singing, Mother uh, my M is for the many things you gave me, or take Eddie Fisher's Oh My Papa, to me he was so wonderful. And that wasn't so long ago. Now movies used to portray the mother as a central figure of adoration. Now she's more often depicted as a meddler, an intrusive, controlling person, a gossipy, annoying yenta. Now I know the entertainment industry always says that it's just uh, reflecting the values of society, but I think in many ways it may be creating them as well. Okay, slide 14, which was the picture of the uh, grandfather and grandson. One thing that is not disappearing, in fact is growing more prevalent, is grandparenting. As Brian and Nelson Paston wrote, truth be told, being a grandma is as close as we ever get to perfection. The ultimate warm sticky bun with raisins and nuts, clouds nine, 10, and 11. Happily, this relationship is a big deal for grandchildren too. The overwhelming majority of adult grandchildren surveyed said their grandparents influenced their values and behaviors. Slide 15. Okay, there are record 70 million grandparents in the U.S. today, an increase of only almost a quarter in the last 50 years. Overall, adults over 30 of them, more than one in three, are grandparents. And that's thanks to that big fat cohort, the baby boomers I mentioned before, and our general population growth. I mean, when I was a kid, there were 150 million Americans. Now there are almost 350 million, so of course more of us are gonna be grandparents. Fortunately too, people are living longer, which means 90% of adolescents today will have two or more living grandparents. In 1900, less than 50% did. It's projected that a considerable number of these grandparents will live long enough to become great grandparents, and some, I hope everybody on this Zoom, will live to become great great grandparents. Slide 16. Unfortunately, only one third of grandparents now live within 25 miles of their grandchildren and an overwhelming percentage of grandparents surveyed wish they could see the children more often. I was very fortunate in that I lived across the street from my grandparents and it was a wonderful perk of my childhood. Most grandparents have on average four to five grandchildren. The average age of becoming a grandparent is 50 years for women and a few years older for men. A third of grandparents say they spoil their grandchildren by buying them too much, but they continue to shell out. Grandparents spend an average of over uh, $2,500 annually on their grandchildren, which amounts to about $179 billion a year. It's a big, big market. They spend it on toys, clothing, and later on on school supplies and tuition. Before the pandemic, many grandparents also took their children on vacation. And in the book, I discuss to whom grandparenting is a bigger part of their lives than others and all the different styles of grandparenting that we see today, because there is a big range. Now, of course, there is so much that I didn't have time to discuss today that I take up in the book, Parents of Adult Children, You Are Not Alone. For example, what do children feel they owe their parents? Which I find a fascinating question. And what do the parents feel they owe their grand? What do the ch adult feel children feel they owe the parents? And what do the parents feel they owe, owe the children? What about downsizing and leaving a legacy, both tangible and intangible? Then there's so many other more disturbing issues, mental illness, addiction to opioids and alcohol, anorexia, which particularly targets young adult women, 
children with special needs who are aging out of the system and have nowhere to go, etc. But the book is far from one long litany of woes. I took my cue from my sister-in-law, whose mantra is solve, don't suffer. And as I wind up this part of the presentation, I think you get it that the phrase, it's complicated, doesn't even begin to cover the new adult family. But as a historian, I am struck by how resilient this institution has always been over the millennia. Family is in our DNA, so I don't despair that it's going away anytime soon. It may be a far cry from the Norman Rockwell Leave it to Beaver picture I painted at the outset of this talk, but may no, make no mistake, it is family nonetheless. And here's a very good summing up of where many uh, parents of adult children are today. And this is from Margaret Atwood, who wrote in The Handmaid's Tale. No mother is ever completely a child's idea of what a mother should be. And I suppose it works the other way around as well. But despite everything, we didn't do too badly by one another. We did as well as most. And now I'm going to read um, two poems that are in the book that I find very touching and uh, speak to the family today. They're by uh, a Santa Barbara uh, poet named Linda Schwartz, and the first is called The Circle of Life. She ushered me into the world, at, and at the beginning of my life, held me gently in her arms, nurtured and fed me, bathed and dressed me, cleaned up after my accidents, pushed me in a stroller on glorious sunny days, and loved me unconditionally. I ushered her out of the world and near the end of her life, held her gently in my arms, comforted and fed her, bathed and dressed her, cleaned up after her accidents, pushed her in a wheelchair on glorious sunny days and loved her unconditionally. Parent tending child, child tending parent within the circle of life. The next poem is called Standing on the Shore. My grandson stands at Pond's Edge, holding his parents' hand, traits of East reflected in his face. Tossed pebbles skim the pond's surface, transforming placid waters into ripple after ripple after ripple, lulling waves on an outward journey, blending generation to generation, father to son, mother to daughter, grandchild to grandparent, continuity of family, customs, traditions, washing gently on pond's sandy shore to greet a waiting child. So thank you once again to Stephanie Holland and uh, to Ken Pienkos. You really made this so pleasant for me. And we have a few minutes if anybody has an easy, has a question, but please make it easy so I can look smart. Anything in the chat box? I have a question. Yes. 